don't know me, I'm Stevia. Um, I moved to Tennessee two years ago, and um, I don't always make it to this service, but I've been a part of the Zen group for a year, um, so I know many faces. Um, I moved to Tennessee for a job at Arnold Air Force Base. I work as a botanist and an ecologist, and I've been working in body or ecology for about eight years now. I'll try to speak slowly. I'm a Yankee. Some people tell me I sound like a squirrel and fast forward. <laughs> so I've been thinking a lot about the idea of sacred plants for a long time, both the ways that they come up in religion and the way um, humanity has incorporated them uh, in, through that for history and the way I view plants as sacred. So I'll attempt to describe very broadly the way that plants come up in religion over the years. And I'd like to share with you um, some of the ways that plants factor into my own spirituality and worldview through my experiences as a botanist. So researching this talk was really overwhelming because I started out trying to describe plants in religion through all of world history, um, which is a, a huge subject, so we're only going to talk about a few things. Um, I'm not a historian, so I'm sure I'm going to get some things wrong, and you're welcome to correct me during the talk back. Um, I have to skip many religions and in, ignore entire continents um, because of time constraints. And this will be a, a heavily Western bias talk, um, both for time reasons and a uh, product of the information that was easily available to me. So, briefly starting in the prehistoric, um, we, before we have detailed rec uh, records of organized religion, um, humans had a more diffused way of, localized way of expressing spirituality and this is best represented as tribal shamanism. So in shamanism, specific plants were held sacred um, for mostly their healing power and also their ritual significance. Um, so plants at this time were very directly providers for humanity. People lived every day with the reality that they were medicine and food, and that's how people sustain their lives. Um, and specific plants were held even more holy um, for ritual significance in, in the days when shamanism reigned Psychoactive plants were used to create altered states of consciousness, um, where shamans believed this allowed them to directly interact with the spirit world. Um, so plants gave people life in very direct ways, but also allowed them to access the beyond. Um, so following shamanism, um, we can have a few brief examples of plants in ancient civilization. Um, there's many ways that plants are represented here, but there's one motif in particular that's present across almost every earlier religion <coughs> that we came across, um, and that's the tree of life. It's not always called the tree of life, but sacred trees figure prominently in the mythos of most of the faiths that I researched, and um, a lot talk about all of these, but the symbol is present in various ways in ancient Iran, ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, Mesoamerica, Buddhism, Hinduism, early China, Christianity, Germanic paganism, North mythology, Abrahamic religions, and modern paganism. So trees are kind of a big deal. So we'll talk a lot about those. Um, and I'll start with uh, ancient religions, um, Egypt and Iran, because they're some of the earliest religions that we have some of the best records for. Um, so even before uh, Egypt was united as a kingdom in 3100 BC, um, even before then, trees are recorded as associated with deities. Um, some gods emerged from trees and others were sheltered by them. The sycamore tree was of special significance in Egyptian religion. It was one of the most useful native trees due to its size uh, and it often grew along the edge of the desert which placed it near the necropolis. Um, so in some illustrations, the trees are anthropomorphized as suckling the dead with their branches. Um, some other trees were also re revered and associated with uh, deities such as the acacia and the willow. And um, there were male gods that had this association, but the association uh, with female gods was much stronger. And this is a common thing in early religion that um, female energy is, is most strongly associated with nature, and that's, that's a very common motif because the life-giving force mm -hmm. thing. So several maternal deities in ancient Egypt were tree goddesses, and that meant that burial in a wooden coffin was viewed as a return to the womb of mother goddess. In Iran, um, that's another one of the earliest documented religions, um, is, that's Zoroastrianism, and um, that began in 2000 BC, 
And amazingly, it still survives today as the world's oldest still active religion. Um, so they had a tree called Hawama, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, and that was one of their most sacred plants due to a drink that was made from it. And this um, drink had great healing properties. It was used heavily in medicine. So that was one of the reasons it was sacred. So the plant and the drink is one of the central features of Zoroastrian ritual. Uh, Haoma is also personified as divinity, um, so it can bestow essential qualities such as health, fertility, husbands for maidens, and even immortality. There is one specific Haoma in their legends called Gaukerena, and it was planted by Akura Mazda, who is the soul god of Zoroastrianism. Um, the existence of this tree is said to ensure the continuance of life in the universe. And this religion also has a devil figure, um, Ahriman, who is the destructive spirit and adversary to God. So this devil created a frog to invade the tree and destroy it, um, aiming to prevent all trees from growing on earth, and thus, by extension, destroying life itself. So as a reaction, Ahri Mazda, their god, uh, created two carfish to guard the tree. And these two carfish are always staring at the frog and ready to react to it, uh, thus saving creation. <laughs> so skipping hundreds of years ahead in time, we have Buddhism. And in this religion, or philosophy, if you will, um, there are several instances in which um, plants play an important spiritual role. And one of the most important symbols is the Bodhi tree. Uh, the phrase Bodhi tree can mean two things. First, it can refer to this one specific tree under which Siddhartha Gautama, or the Buddha, obtained enlightenment. In a broader sense, a uh, Bodhi tree can also denote any tree which a person has attained enlightenment, thus achieving Buddhahood. Um, so to keep you appraised of where we are in the timeline, we are uh, now in the 6th century to the 4th century BC, that's when Buddha lived. Um, but the tree, of course, was probably before, born before the Buddha. So the Bodhi tree was a type of fig um, that botanists now call Ficus religiosa, uh, its common name being sacred fig. And I love the name of this tree because it's uh, been sacred long before botanical Latin existed. So the scientific moniker that denotes the species and genus actually reflects the plant's cultural and spiritual significance. Um, both the image of the tree and its heart-shaped leaves are very common within Buddhist iconography. And it can be a symbol of both the Buddha and of enlightenment itself. So there's three living trees that are particularly import important in Buddhist piety. Um, the first tree is where the Buddha obtained enlightenment in Bihar, India. The original tree does not live. Um, it has been planted with its offspring three times throughout the course of history. Um, there are two other Bodhi trees that have great religious significance, um, one in India and the other in Sri Lanka. And both are believed to be propagated from cutting from the original Bodhi tree. Um, the tree in Sri Lanka still lives today. Uh, it's 2,300 years old. Um, it's one of the oldest uh, trees that has a known planting date by humans. Um, and it's still a very respected relic uh, to Buddhists in Sri Lanka and all over the world. Uh, and many temples in, throughout the Buddhist world have um, Bodhi trees growing in them, and many of them are, are believed to be offspring from the <coughs> Sri Lanka. Um, the worship of these trees is an important form of Buddh Buddhist piety in these countries. So history aside, there's a lot of mysticism and folklore that surround these trees, um, most of which did not really make it overseas to Western Buddhism, um, but I'll give them a brief mention. Um, it's sometimes believed that neither the fruits nor the leaves of the famous Sri Lankan tree ever fall on the ground. Um, some Buddhists believe that this tree can emanate light, can cause rain, can grant fertility to women. So in terms of folklore, we're still seeing uh, the basic needs of early culture uh, being sought um, from, a, as a, from, a, from plants in a spiritual manner. And lastly, I'll mention the lotus under the Buddhist category. Um, it's another very popular symbol, and it represents purity of the body, speech, and mind. Um, it's something that's rooted in muddy waters, which is a metaphor for life um, and attachment, but it's a thing of beauty that blooms above the mud, and the water that slides easily off its petals is a symbol of detachment. <coughs> So I wanted to mention Hinduism really briefly, but I need—I cut it off for time. Um, there's many sacred plants in uh, Hinduism, Hinduism, such as holy basil, sacred fig, uh, and sandalwood. And most of these plants have uh, either practical, real-world value, but.
but they're also very strongly associated mythologically with different gods. <coughs> so jumping ahead a little bit to um, pre-Christian Europe, we have one of the most explicit examples of a tree of life, um, or a world tree, called Yggdrasil. Um, and I learned about this in world history, I'm not sure if you all did, but um, Yggdrasil is central to North, Norse mythology. It's this immense world uh, mythological tree that connects the nine worlds of Norse cosmology, and the gods hold their daily council at the base of the tree. There's numerous animals that are said to live among Yggdrasil's branches and roots. Um, at the base is a dragon and several snakes that gnaw on the roots, and an eagle perches on its upper branches, um, and there's a squirrel that scurries up and down, conveying the dragon's insults um, to the eagle, and vice versa. And meanwhile, there's four stags that graze on the leaves. And though these animals and their activities seem kind of innocent, they hold a deeper significance. Um, <coughs> the image of the tree being nibbled away represents its mortality, and along with it, the mortality of the cosmos that depends on it. Um, so remember the ancient Iranian myth of the tree whose uh, existence was tied to the well-being of the entire universe? Well, we see that the exact same thing here thousands of years later um, in a different continent. Um, so Yggdrasil was the center of the geographical, uh, was the geographical center of the cosmos, and um, all of existence depended on it. And so when the tree trembles, it signals the arrival of Ragnarok, which is the destruction of the universe. So there are a lot of early religions that have these mythological cre trees where um, creation depends on their very existence. And when we get into the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, um, plants are still featured as important symbols, but creation doesn't seem to hinge in, on them as much anymore. And it's in fact with the Abrahamic faiths that we start to see a more mixed relationship between humanity and plants. And the relationship stays kind of positive in Judaism. Maybe it's because the, it's the oldest of the religions. It's um, over 3,000 years old. And as Judaism sees it, um, so I've read, uh, a tree stood at the very center of the first human moral dilemma when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge. Um, some traditions hold that this was a fig, not an apple tree. So we're, we're seeing a lot of figs up here. And even though this tree allowed Adam and Eve to doom themselves and their descendants to a life uh, in exile from paradise, the tree offered them their first step towards spiritual redemption by offering uh, its fig leaves to cover their nakedness. Um, planting trees is a very beloved act in the rabbinic imagination. It embodies the Jewish responsibility for um, each generation to cultivate resources for the next. Uh, there's a quote in a midrash, which is an interpretation of sacred texts, um, that says, quote, if you have a sapling in your hand and you are told, look, the Messiah is here, you should first plant the sapling and then go out and welcome the Messiah, end quote. <laughs> in the Jewish tradition, nothing is more important than the Torah. So it says a lot that rabbis chose a tree as the primary symbol for the presence of the Torah in the world. Um, so if humanity's failure of, of this moral litmus test at the Tree of Knowledge sets humankind on this journey to the world beyond paradise, the Tree of Life, represented as the Torah, emerges as a source of protection, sustenance, and proper living that allows humanity to continually reconnect with its highest self. So on to Islam. Um, Judaism predates Islam, and it's my understanding that Muslims incorporate uh, Jewish history as part of their own. So there's many similarities between the two religions um, and a fairly similar approach to plants in their holy books. The Quran has almost the same Adam and Eve story um, that you know from the Bible, except that the tree of knowledge might better translate to the tree of immortality, and Eve's name is Hawa. Um, so there's just one tree referenced in Eden, um, but there's many plants in the Muslim depiction of paradise or heaven. Uh, these plants are used as signs of the Creator's <coughs> power and majesty. Um, paradise is considered this beautiful place where you're endlessly and effortlessly provided for, and plants of, are an integral part of that. The Quran is more than 1,400 years old, but it comes out of a very scientifically advanced civilization. So the cool part about the Quran is that there are 22 plants that are so specifically described um, that they're identifiable by modern science um, down to their genus and species. And one of them is, of course, a fig tree. Um, there's still a lot of figs 
out there. Um, <laughs> finally, we've got Christianity. And Christianity is a religion that seems to have one of the most fraught relationships with plants. Um, and in early days in Europe, uh, uh, Christianity kind of hid itself around paganism, changing their holidays to match the solstices. But later, Christianity became the norm and gained a lot of power. And previously, we've seen history, um, through, through history, uh, plants are revered in a way that reflects that nature is a direct provider for humanity. And somewhere along the line, agriculture and an increasingly modern civilization allowed people to feel more divorced from nature. And the timeline is really fuzzy and varies by geography. Um, but at some point, especially in Western civilizations, nature went from being a divine provider to something that needs to be tamed and controlled in order to provide. So we can track this attitude historically by looking at early depictions of Mary um, in poems and artwork. And in paintings and drawings and woodcuts by Northern European artists, Mary is usually dressed in very regal, expensive uh, clothes. She's almost always painted indoors um, and with very fancy architecture. And when she is depicted outdoors, it's mostly um, in manicured gardens and surrounded by a hedge or a wall or a screen of roses. Mm -hmm. And this is a very domesticated version of nature and um, at that, a very domesticated and controlled version of femininity. Mm -hmm. um, the plants that are associated with the Virgin Mary are lilies, lily of the valley, strawberries, irises, and primroses. Um, all of these plants, especially the lily and the rose, um, refer to the chastity and, holy, and um, faith of the Holy Virgin. And they're symbolic pl plants of Mary, not because of their medicinal or ritualistic powers, like in early religions, um, but just because of their beauty and association with innocence. So while nature used to be more strongly associated with the feminine and life-giving forces, we've moved on to a male god here. And only one male god at that where all other worship is considered false idol. So since the beginning of Christian culture, um, it has been argued that if humans understand themselves as spiritual beings um, and the creation of God in its own image, then the task is to distance oneself as far as possible from nature um, and making that distinction that, uh, as, as making that separation as distinct as possible. The more humans use their strength of will to shield themselves from their inner nature and the nature they encounter in plants and animals, the more people can participate in the spiritual realm and become closer to God. So the tendency of culture to fence people off from nature tends to lead to a polarization of values. Nature is bad, spirit is good. Uh, many other medieval paintings go so far as to demonize nature. Um, forests and woodlands and paintings become associated with witches. Um, which is the wild feminine opposite to Mary. Mary only mediates between man and God, while witches possess knowledge of plants to uh, heal and poison and bewitch. Um, so there's a lot of demonization of knowledge in Abrahamic religions, uh, if you think about it. And there's a lot more to say about Christianity, but I don't have time to say it. <laughs> but regardless, it seems clear that plants are this universal motif in religion. And some modern religions, Christianity, um, have tried to distance themselves from plant worship as they relied less and less on nature and more and more on civilization and cultivation. Um, that being said, we've, I'm viewing everything through a Western lens here, and there's lots of um, modern religions that maintain uh, their original heritage of, of, re of reverence for plants. And I could talk about paganism, but I have a feeling we've already had some talks about paganism here, so I'll skip that one for now. I'm sure you guys know a little bit about it. So for the first little bit, I wanted to take some time to talk about how I, how I as a scientist incorporate plants into my own spirituality. And for the record, I was raised UU, um, and my mom used to take me to pagan solstice celebrations at the church. Um, so I grew up with a lot of latitude to incorporate whatever I wanted into my belief system. So I've worked um, in research stations and plant labs across the country. My master's degree is in conservation ecology, and I work as a botanist and ecologist now. So you'd think for somebody as conservation-oriented as myself, my resume would have a lot of like saving baby plants and chaining myself in front of bulldozers, and I have done a bit of that. Um, but when you, when you look into my career, you'd be surprised at how much time I spend killing things. 
Um, and to this, to this effect, I'm talking about invasive species management. So unless you get really lucky, um, in my field, you pay dues by doing invasive species removal. So I've killed garlic mustard, honeysuckle, privet. Um, I've led volunteer days where I've had whole ha frat houses chopping down trees of heaven. Um, and there's legitimate reasons for doing that. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily change the fact that as I've gone up in my career, I've left entire graveyards behind. <laughs> and during these jobs, about once a week, I'll be elbow deep in a pile of Dame's Rocket or something, and I'll stop and think, oh, what if God is a plant, and I'm committing genocide right now, and I'm going to show up at the pearly gates and find out that I'm Hitler. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a concern. <laughs> um, but the thing that wins out uh, when I have these thoughts is my desire to protect biodiversity, um, which invasives can threaten. And biodiversity is important to me to protect, not only because it's vital to the functioning of ecosystems upon which we all rely, um, but it's one of those things that lets me see the, the, the mundane parts of the world as totally epic. So here's my best example of this. Um, say you're walking over someone's lawn that they don't monocult you know, herbicide it into a monoculture, and um, you could just think you're walking over grass, or you could look down and you could see clover, fescue, dandelions, oriental lady's thumb, violets, and moss, and each one of those um, plants has an entirely different family lineage. So you could see a lawn, or you could see this painting of hundreds of millions of years of evolution. You could see life and death and competition and adaptation, and it's all beneath your feet. And it's a snapshot into a history that's unfathomably long. Um, and it's a part of history that uh, we as humans have been inextricably linked since the beginning of our species and before that. These plants that are things that sustain our lives, and from early culture up until today, that's true. And we write legends and songs about them. Our gods have lived inside of them. And you can choose every day to see and understand that and feel connected to it, even if you're just standing in your own front yard. Trees are another very awe-inspiring plant to me. Um, my, uh, ancient religion tends to agree with me. Um, and to me, it's because you can view each one as a st statistical miracle. So viewed in a certain way, all of life is a, is a statistical miracle. But I think trees really take it to the next level here. So as animals, we have mobility that helps us protect our offspring. Um, for a tree, if a deer comes along to eat a seedling, or if a you know a squirrel comes by and eats an acorn, the, the parent tree has a really hard time coming to the rescue. Um, and if a seed lands in an unfavorable growing condition, it simply has to return to the soil. Um, there are certain ways that trees do feed and rear their young that I don't have time to go into. It's very interesting, and you can ask me later. Um, <laughs> But despite the efforts of the tree, it's extremely rare for their offspring to survive. Um, in fact, it's so rare that on average, one tree produces um, just one offspring to make it to adulthood to replace it. And on the lower end, beeches produce about 1.8 million seeds in their lifetime. And on the higher end, poplars produce uh, 54 million seeds per year for a total of over a billion seeds in their lifetime. So the fact that animals are here doesn't impress me. So your ancestors could fight off predators and go for miles in search of food and water for their children. But you walk through a forest and you know that every single adult tree is a lottery winner. Um, the odds of each one existing is millions and billions to one and it can make a, a, a walk through the woods um, seem kind of mind-blowing and precious. So learning about ecology can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, it can make everything look like a freaking miracle, um, and it also can be a little depressing. Um, and I can't say it better than Aldo Leopold once wrote, um, quote, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Much of the damage inflicted on the land is quite invisible to laymen, as an ecologist must either harden his shell and make believe that the consequences of science are none of his business, or he must be the doctor who sees the marks of death in a community that believes itself well and does not want to be told otherwise, end quote. So that's some pretty heavy stuff. But I know what he means. Um, I see invasives wherever I go. I can't walk along a riverbank without stopping uh, every 10 feet to pull up garlic mustard. I can tell when a forest has been heavily overbrowsed, and I know that this means that urban forests where there's no deer hunting, um, they're slowly dying from the ground up. But I believe that there's more options given to us uh, than Aldo Leopold. There's more than ringing an un unheard alarm bell, and there's more than hardening your shell so that you don't care. 
To me, the third option is doing what you can while maintaining a daily insistence on beauty and wonder. I used to be a caretaker at an arboretum in Michigan, and there was this flower called Dean's Rocket that was invasive. And um, when the weekends came around, I led volunteer work days where we just pulled truckloads of it in an attempt to eradicate it from the arb. But when I wasn't working, I let myself enjoy it. Um, it's this bright flower, it's like very vibrant purple, and it can be um, a lot of different shades from, from deep purple to bright fuchsia to lavender. And they carpet the hillsides, and I do what I can to heal the land as an ecologist, but I love how Dame's Rocket looks, and I refuse to let knowledge take that beauty away from me. So I can still be a little cynical about the world, but I've found many reasons to hope. And you'd think for someone like me, the fact that invasives are hard to kill is a reason for despair. But it's also um, one of the best things I've come to understand is how hard it is to eradicate plants from anywhere. I worked one summer in Georgia uh, taking care of a small three-acre garden, and we would immaculately weed each bed. And by the time we finished the last one, uh, weeds would be all over the first again. And we'd put this thick black plastic cloth over parts of the ground to discourage weeds, and they would just erupt through with no light. Um, and there was a perimeter around the garden, which we would nuke with Roundup. I'm probably going to get cancer later. Um, and all that eventually happened was that we bred herbicide-resistant weeds. So here's what I've decided. We will lose some rare plants uh, now and in the future, and biodiversity will be affected by climate change, and our ecosystems will change in unpredictable ways. But plant life is also beautifully adaptable and miraculous in its persistence, and nothing we do can completely destroy it. This is what gives me comfort. Plants evolved uh, 2,500 to 800 million years ago. I know wherever you go outside, you're walking past ancient lineages that made animal life on the earth possible. I know that trees have their own child-rearing strategies, but despite that, forests are made out of individual statistical anomalies. I know that it didn't take very long for plants to thrive uh, in Chernobyl after the um, nuclear reactor exploded. I know plants can, can split electrons out of water and the trees make their trunks out of air, if you think about it. Um, I know that the world is going to change and it's not always going to take on a form that I like or recognize, but I think the essential nature of what I love is um, going to persist long after I'm gone and long after our civilization ends, whenever that may be. I know we'll sacrifice a lot of beauty and diversity along the way, but many species will persist. And some of that weedy, adaptable vegetation may end up saving our species one day, because humanity's existence is forever tied to plants. I know that we've been pulling Dame's Rocket in the Arboretum in Michigan years before I came along, and we'll do so for decades to come. But I know if you boil it all down, some things are simply impossible to destroy. And believe me when I say that, because I have killed enough plants to know. So thank you for listening. I hope I didn't go over time or anything, and I look forward to your questions at the talk back. So thank you.